Welcome everyone to today's CSIA Wednesday webinar series. My name is Colin Hammond and I will be your host today. From its start, CSIA was built on the principle of collaboration and with the goal to advance the industry of control system integration. In times of crisis, our members have turned to the CSI community as a trusted source for advice and inspiration. In line with this, we have begun this Wednesday webinar series. Our goal is to help our community manage, survive, and hopefully thrive from the current crisis. We plan to cover a wide range of topics on coping and or leveraging the current situation and have SIs, vendor partners, and special guests present. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CSIA, we are a global nonprofit professional association with over 500 member companies in 40 countries. Our mission is to advance the practice of control system integration to benefit our members and their clients. Our vision is to ensure that manufacturing and process industries everywhere have access to low risk, safe and successful application of automation technology. CSIA membership offers members accesses to resources needed to attain and exceed business goals. To highlight just a few of our many member benefits, the CSIA Best Practice Manual guides control system integration companies in the setup and running of a solid company. CSIA's Business Insurance Program offers members an excellent insurance program for business owners, subcontractors, and more. The program includes members from all over the world enjoying the peace of mind that comes with CSI insurance. Clients in all industries are now seeking integrators with a CSI certification alongside ISO. They recognize CSI certified integrators commitment to industry standards and business acumen. As a result, being certified can shorten the sales cycle. CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange is the premier automation guide featuring system integrators and suppliers to provide industrial, manufacturing, and process automation solutions. For integrators and suppliers, it's a place to market their expertise. Clients will find white papers, <coughs> case studies, capabilities, contact information, and engage in conversation directly with CSIA members. Please follow CSIA's online events calendar for all upcoming webinars, including partner webinars, business webinars, and our Wednesday webinar series. CSIA business webinars features topics handpicked by CSIA leadership to help you run your business. CSIA partner webinars are opportunities given to CSIA's industry partners to address hot topics and demonstrate their expertise. You won't want to miss these opportunities to learn from the comfort of your own office or home. And for more information about CSIA, please visit our website or contact us at info at staff.controlsys.org or 847-686-2245. And at this time, I would like to pass it over to our presenter, Jim Ralston. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Colin, and uh, appreciate everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm Jim Ralston. I'm Softing's uh, Director of Channel Sales here in North America. Uh, my background, though, uh, it, you know, includes working and supporting uh, industrial networks going back to the 90s and then IT networks going back to the 80s. So that that usually means I'm really old. So uh, anyway, um, we uh, today we've uh, put together a presentation that uh, focuses on some of the challenges that you may have, uh, ways to rectify problems that your customers face uh, and that you may be responsible for as far as maintaining and troubleshooting industrial networks, uh, specifically industrial ethernet. Uh, there's obviously been a, a big change in how uh, contractors can work with in customers these days as far as performing services 
Uh, as a supplier of industrial network tools, we've seen a, a big increase in, in customers needing uh, tools because they're no, no longer able to have uh, contractors to come in and do their network troubleshooting, right? Or there's some restrictions on that side. So there's a lot of challenges uh, that, that are faced as far as rectifying problems quickly and also uh, maintaining uh, IT security policies. So, uh, so this today's presentation will uh, take into account those uh, factors. Um, Tom Jallo uh, is, uh, could, could not unfortunately be live with us today. Uh, he got pulled out to do uh, training at one of our customer sites, uh, customers. Uh, but Tom is our director of customer support, which is a, a very uh, uh, undefining title because he's uh, very active it, with uh, I, the IT networks uh, troubleshooting tools that, that we support and sell, and also is a member of the TIA 568 uh, subcommittee for industrial networks. And Tom, I believe, is also involved with a lot of the work in defining the two-wire Ethernet standard that's coming out. So while Tom couldn't be with us today, uh, he is with us virtually because we have a few uh, videos that I'll be playing throughout the presentation uh, where we actually demonstrate some of the tools. All right, so let me click slides here. So uh, today I'm going to cover some of the profitability challenges uh, that our integrator partners have, and that's specifically oriented to uh, failures and issues with industrial networks, uh, both during startup and, and during the maintenance periods. Uh, what are some of the common industrial networks that are found? Um, and uh, okay, let me see. Make sure I am properly sharing my screen. Okay. There you go, Jim. Looks there great. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, you would think with all the zooms I do, <laughs> this would be second nature. So let me get back to this slide. So anyway, so this is today's topic and I already did the introduction with uh, myself and Tom. Um, so today I'll be going over the profitability challenges that you as an integrator may face, uh, especially revolving around the importance of the industrial ethernet uh, networks uh, that run the automation systems, common industrial network problems, uh, some, uh, practical ways of doing testing and you know both both for ethernet cables copper and fiber and also uh, layer two testing uh, ways that you can assist your customers and this goes back to the challenges i mentioned earlier about being on site or not being able to be on site uh, and some of the remote access uh, tools uh, you know technologies that are available today um, while walking through these uh, different ways of doing testing uh, we will also have uh, some videos that uh, Tom Jallo has pre-recorded, so I'll be playing those. And then towards the end, I'll give you a little broader overview of what Softing does, uh, who we are, uh, and take questions. And I, I should jump back to and uh, mention that one of the themes of Softing, the theme of Softing is get connected, stay connected, and stay connected uh, for, from a industrial network perspective is very, very important. <laughs> So that stay connected is the theme uh, that we use for uh, offering tools to our customers. And that's what this session is about. So let's talk about profitability risk. Uh, one of the number one risks to your projects uh, that you have when uh, dealing with automation systems is unplanned disruptions, right? So uh, being there to get ready to do a startup with a key customer on a million dollar line and something isn't working correctly. What is, what is not working correctly? I'm not able to see a drive, right? Or, you know, there's a lot of things that you're dependent upon um, that industrial network and any type of disruption to that uh, causes more and more time spent, right? And uh, ethernet cable uh, and network failures, you know, unplanned expenses. This could be during startup. This could be going, you know, 
know, on uh, long term, if you're signed up to do maintenance or support maintenance for your customer, and you know, maybe their IT contractor is not available, right? So, um, so a lot of challenges there, and. Um, and then the big issue, like I mentioned, is uh, you know how to do some of these services remotely if you have to, right? So maybe lack of local IT support, reliance on the contractors just isn't possible. Um, and a simple network problem could run into costly production downtime. Um, ISA had an interesting study of their process customers a while back, and I, I think this would apply to manufacturers in general. Uh, asking you know what are the the common reasons for network failures industrial network failures and the interesting result of that was 70% of the of the outages was either the physical layer which is cabling and patch panels things like that uh, or the next layer up, which is the data link layer, which is the simple layer that the switches use to connect everything together, right? Um, some of the reasons for this can be, you know, physical deterioration of the cabling, uh, you know, wear and tear, right? Um, configuration issues with the switches, right? Um, in some industries, uh, the cost of downtime is very expensive. So something as simple as uh, some vibration damage to a cable could equate to hundreds of thousands of dollars in downtime because of the time it takes to locate and fix that problem. Uh, we work with a number of the automotive uh, you know, manufacturers as an example and you know, cost of downtime could be you know, as much as $10,000 a minute, maybe even more, right? So, uh, so in, in, uh, because of the reliance on the industrial network, any uh, time delay in having a problem and correcting it can be a huge expense, right? Uh, and we work within customers quite often that are concerned about this and, and therefore want the correct tools and the right training. And in your case, working with your customers, you know, have make sure that you have that expertise and tools as well. So what are some of the common problems in industrial networks? And, and again, for our, all the integrators on the phone, you guys probably live and breathe this or, or your uh, engineering staffs do. Uh, damaged cables, right? Opens and shorts. You know, where is the problem? Which cable is damaged? Where is it damaged, right? How, how can I quickly repair it? Um, the cable length is too long. You know, there are distance limitations. And, you know, when you have cables that were installed by a contract originally 10 years maybe ago right how who knows how that cable snaked around how long is that cable uh, actually right uh, intermittent wiring issues because of vibration damage very common shielding uh, it's a very good best practice in industrial networks to use shielded cable is the shield connected? Is it the proper grade of shielding, right? What about interference problems? Uh, so the cabling, you know, was originally installed. Um, uh, the cables test out perfectly, you know, as, as far as being electrically sound. But then once all the equipment comes online, there's interference, right? EMI, RFI, that can cause problems. Um, and then one of the things that is a big trend these days too, is the issue of can the cable support the network speed and why it's an issue is because networks are getting faster and faster there's more need uh, to have a faster network to send more data packets because it's not just sending messages between plcs and and devices you know the the network might be doing some real-time vision systems or have video monitoring or supporting you know wireless access points or having some hybrid it responsibilities right so the need for speed is there uh, and as the network speeds increase like putting in new switches for example can that cable support it right because it's much more than a question of electrical uh, you know conductivity as it is uh, being able to support the high frequencies of the cable 
Um, with fiber optics, uh, so uh, there's a whole range of things that can go wrong with fiber cable. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail today about fiber because that could easily be an hour session itself. Uh, but most common things would be, you know, a damage, uh, you know, break of the cable, high attenuation because of poor splicing. Um, one of the most common issues is that the connector face, uh, you know, has actually been, you know, damaged or is dirty. Um, um, and that can result in slow fiber link connections. So it's not down, it's just slow. Um, and then there's also the, the media connectors, which are called SFPs, uh, you know, they could have an issue, right? Um, that's the little interface that goes from the, uh, the switch or, or uh, the device to the fiber, right? So all those things are issues that can go wrong uh, in industrial environments um, with the cabling. If you get up a layer, Layer to the data link layer, well, this is where your switches reside. And uh, there could be issues with switches not properly configured, not supporting the right port speeds, um, not having a proper VLAN set up. Uh, if it's a smart managed switch, you know, there may be some routing functions that aren't, uh, you know, in, configured correctly. There can also be problems with performance. Again, maybe configuration issues or faulty equipment that could cause uh, you know, bandwidth issues that you know, the network's just not fast enough or that portion isn't. Uh, latency issues where there's, it just takes too, too long for packets uh, to make it especially an issue if they're you know, doing high speed uh, remote IO over ethernet like ethernet IP produce consume. Um, and then a big trend too is doing uh, you know, powering devices on the plant floor from the switches themselves. And that's a technology called power over ethernet. Uh, PoE, you, you can already see it as ways to power uh, access points. Um, network cameras, and you may see more and more devices using that because it simplifies the wiring, right? You could just use the ethernet cable to power something, but how do you know that that switch is putting out enough power, right? So how can you measure that? Uh, that's an issue, uh, and there's usually a budget issue as well with uh, the switches. So, uh, so one of the things I want to step back a second and just explain, and you know, this this happens to be Softing's uh, port, portfolio of uh, IT network uh, troubleshooting tools, um, of which we overlap greatly with industrial too. Um, I'm not putting this up to pitch all the tools we have, but to explain that there is a big difference between cable certification uh, and cable qualification. Okay, um, so softing we you know we do offer certifier tools, uh, certification tools for both copper and fiber. Um, the certification is a requirement for TIA 568. TIA 568 is the standards that define things like what Cat 5e is, what Kic. CAT 6A is, what the fiber optic OM standards are. And a big portion of that standard has to do with how to test an installation to certify that the installation was done correctly. This is a very common thing that's done in uh, commercial buildings. If a installer contractor is hired to put in uh, wiring within a, you know, an office building, a, you know, a university campus, uh, a government building, let's say, um, it would be defined in the project requirements for them to do certification, to use a certification tool as a way to ensure that they did their job, okay? Um, that's a very good best practice for any company, any manufacturer that's uh, hiring a contractor to do ethernet cable installation, always insist on certification. But what a certifier doesn't do is uh, test the actual environment, right? It's, it's just looking at basically that cable installation. It's not looking at what speed is it capable of. It's not uh, troubleshooting exactly, you know, what the problems may be with the cable. It doesn't do anything with link layer two. Yeah, data link two, uh, layer two, right? The, the switch layer. Um, that's where a qualifier can be a really 
really, really good handy tool uh, as a practical troubleshooting tool uh, for industrial networks. It's not certifying, but it's actually performing the tests that qualify that the installation uh, will support the industrial network, uh, you know, based on the environment, like interference, for example, and shielding, uh, while also having very handy troubleshooting tools. So I just wanted to explain that uh, because I'm going to do a deeper dive into what uh, a, a qualifier is and show you all some demonstrations on how it could be used to practically and quickly solve problems uh, at your client sites. So, so some of the things to consider when looking at a qualifier and industrial network troubleshooting tool, uh, portability, uh, is it rugged, right? Uh, does it test not only the physical ca cable layer one, but also the layer two issues that you may encounter? Uh, is it capable or should it be capable of doing both copper and fiber? Uh, we see a mix out there. Some customers are just pure copper. Uh, some have a mix um, and fiber's obviously a very ideal uh, media in a high noise environment like an industrial plant. Uh, is it easy to use? Do you, how much training uh, do your uh, do your engineers need, do the maintenance folks that your end customers need uh, to use it? Do they need to have IT expertise, right? IT training, do they need to be certified or not, right? Um, and then this is something interesting that we've heard from many of our customers too, is uh, because there's so much restrictions on security policy, it's less and less easy to plug in a laptop computer, a foreign laptop computer to do troubleshooting on a network because that laptop's just not allowed to be connected. Um, so the interesting thing uh, is that you, there are tools available like one of our products that's not a computer. You know, it's specifically designed, purpose-built uh, to, to do network diagnostics, cable diagnostics, you know, without uh, having a Windows platform underneath. So it meets that security requirement. And then always, uh, it's also a very good idea to have a way to produce reports uh, because reports are useful for showing, uh, you know, for documenting for the future, what's installed, what's been tested, what's been qualified, uh, and then also an easy way to communicate uh, what the, the uh, troubleshooting results were and report problems. Um, so that's a nice feature too. Um, and then the, the next part I would emphasize is uh, the remote access capability. Uh, it, whatever tool is being used, is there a way to remotely access it to run it uh, in case the folks that are there locally at the plant may not know a lot about troubleshooting uh, you know, Ethernet networks, right? So if you're unable to travel to the customer site, uh, can you have a way to access a tool that would give you the results you need uh, without relying on, you know, uh, IT or engineering folks there at the plant or those that just don't know much about networks, right? Um, and I'll just reemphasize that uh, one of the best practices we like to tout, uh, it's always a good idea to have cables certified at the installation time, right? That is a good practice, that's a best practice. It's also very important though to do qualification uh, during startup and also qualification tools are ideal for troubleshooting, okay? All right, so let me just talk again briefly about some of the tools that uh, the XG has. And um, the XG is actually second generation uh, tester from Softing, um, part of our IT networks group that does all those certification tools, fiber optic OTDRs I showed earlier. Um, and it's really the result of our experience with the needs of our industrial customers, which is the main market I've been working with for 20 plus years, right? <laughs> So uh, some of the key points of uh, the XG is, and I, I actually have one here, I can show in the video if you're looking, uh, portability, 
uh, lightweight, rugged, you know, very rubberized, um, large uh, touch screen that, you know, can easily be, easily be um, used in, you know, by a maintenance person, for example, um, and battery powered. So it's obviously portable, right? Uh, with this tool, you can do uh, cable testing and qualification. I'll go over what that is in a minute. Uh, you can uh, do active network tests, the layer two tests, right? Uh, you can measure PoE with it, that power over Ethernet. And we also have um, the means to do some fiber link testing, uh, which is a very interesting approach to doing fiber troubleshooting uh, because it's not at a certifier layer level, it's one step down and much, much more simpler for someone to test. Um, so, so anyway, that's a quick overview of um, what the XG does. And then one of the key features of it is that remote access capability. And that is done using an embedded VNC server. So VNC is a way, a method to have remote access to a device and be able to remotely control it to be kind of remote, but as if you are there. It's a you know, standard technology that's out there for a number of devices. Um, and we offer it embedded within our XG using built-in Wi-Fi. So the XG uh, at your customer site, you know, let's say a in manufacturer can use the XG to connect into the plant Wi-Fi, all right? And this is separate from the network testing side, right? So those are isolated. Um, you know, become a client to the Wi-Fi connection. And then uh, you have a couple of different options for accessing uh, the actual screens and do remote control of that tester. You know, one is if you have a, the ability to have a VNC connection all the way through, uh, usually it's a TCP port uh, 5900. I believe, um, then you can actually run a VNC client like real VNC on your laptop, no matter where you're located at your headquarters or on the road, dial in or <laughs> dial in, you can tell I'm old, uh, make a remote connection <laughs> to, uh, to the XG and then be able to remotely drive that. And again, from a troubleshooting perspective, this uh, XG is connected to as, as uh, you know, as into an industrial switch it's not a computer, you know, so there's no Windows uh, operating system touching the customer's network. Um, it is uh, isolated because it's, uh, we're just doing a remote control of our device. The other method too, which uh, we can foresee for sure, is the customer themselves may have a computer on their maintenance network uh, that could have our VNC client and be able to remotely drive uh, the XG for cable testing, for network testing, uh, and then use a, uh, you know, a common way for you to connect into that. A Zoom meeting like we're doing today, where you have remote access, remote uh, keyboard and mouse capability, or as a, a Microsoft Teams or a team viewer session, right? Um, so this would just be dependent upon the, your, the customer or, or one of your engineers or workers having a laptop at this level, right? Again, this is just on whatever their Wi-Fi network is. This could be a guest Wi-Fi network. Uh, the, the heavy lifting of the, you know, the network analysis is done um, directly from the XG to the network. And again, not a computer connection there not a Windows machine. Okay, oh, and uh, per that point, um, I'm gonna play our first video. Uh, and um, let me just uh, uh, get that running to show how VNC- Okay, so this is a demonstration of uh, the XG and its VNC connectivity capabilities here. So I have an XG in front of me here. This is uh, an XG running uh, 2.59. That's version 2.59. And we also have VNC uh, viewer software installed on our PC. You can see the details of that there. That is version 6.17 of VNC viewer. So on the XG from the main screen, I'm simply going to choose the settings button. I'm going to work my way down to the Wi-Fi option here. It's automatically going to start scanning for access points. I'm going to grab uh, a known usable network, and I'll do that now. 
I'll select that SSID. Um, I know that this network is DHCP, so that's already suggested. And I can go ahead and type in my Wi-Fi password credentials. Those are chosen here already. You'll have to type those in new on a new network, and I'll just choose to connect. Okay, that's going to authenticate. And it's going to come back, and it's going to give me an IP address that has been cho chosen. So I can see my network, and I can see the IP address that has been chosen for this particular network at the top. And then here at the bottom, I have a few options. Disconnect Wi-Fi is one. I don't want to do that, obviously. I want to choose to enable VNC. So I'll choose that, enable VNC. And then let's step over to my PC and I'll type in that IP address. Into my VNC viewer and I'll hit enter and pops up on my screen a little warning message here. Um, I'll just go ahead and check continue. And now I'm live. I'm live on that on that tester. You can see now. Again, here's the live view of my tester, and you can see the video feed or the VNC feed above it. Just hit the home button. I can choose cable test here. I can work my way through the various options on the XG screen. I'm doing that right now, obviously. Um, on the XG screen, but I can also drive this from uh, the from the PC. So again, live video feed of the XG. Um, I'm just going to make some menu choices here uh, on the uh, PC screen. Let's choose cable test. Let's let's take a look at this test that has not occurred yet. Right, so some labels that have. I've created and haven't tested yet. Um, we can go into cable type here. We can look at projects and reports. We can go back out and go to the tools section. And you can see that there's a number of options here. So full functionality of the XG. I'm driving the XG uh, essentially seamlessly through my PC. I have use of my mouse and I have use of my keyboard of my PC and I can drive that remotely or in person, however you, you choose. All right, very good. So uh, thank you, Tom. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, what Tom just went over is how easy it is to connect the XG to the customer's Wi-Fi network and then use the VNC client software, which is a free download. You know, we don't sell the software, it's, it's free, uh, to connect in and remotely control that uh, XG from anywhere. All right, so, um, so anyway, let me talk about some of the specific uh, cable testing capabilities that the XG has, and I'll also play a, a, a real demo of it in a minute, so I won't spend a lot of time here. But with the XG, uh, one of the biggest questions is, is the cable capable of uh, supporting the application? You know, both wiring-wise, shielding, uh, interference-wise, and, and uh, speed-wise. So with the XG, you can quickly disconnect both ends of the cable, plug it into our tester, find the length of the cable, uh, see if there's any anomalies with the wiring, um, and measure signal to noise ratio, and then do a speed check uh, of that cable all the way up to 10 gig. Um, and we will also give you distance default information uh, in case there are opens. I'll show that in a minute. Um, the uh, the tester is capable of qualifying of doing that uh, speed test uh, all the way down from uh, 100 megabits per second uh, up to 10 gig and supporting two of the new standards that have just come out by IEEE. Uh, that's 2.5 gig and 5 gig. All right, so now I'm going to show, uh, Tom's also going to demonstrate how to actually troubleshoot an ethernet cable with the tool. Okay, let's perform another test with the NetExpert XG. You can see here are the test interfaces on the, uh, on the XG. Um, there's a nice little lid here that keeps them, uh, keeps them protected when you're not using them. 
Also, the test interfaces on the uh, remote unit are here. Let's test a uh, standard shielded cable. So you can see here, this is, uh, this is uh, supposed to be a shielded cable. I have shielded connectors on either side. Uh, shielded connectors on either side. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and plug that into the XG unit. And I'll plug it the other end into the remote. I'm going to go into the cable test. And I've already chosen uh, my uh, cable type as a Cat5e shielded twisted pair. Um, and I've chosen it to test to one gig speed. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit the test button here. First thing it's going to do is run a wire map test. It's going to confirm that uh, all eight conductors are wired as they should, as well as the shield. It's going to be looking for that because we've set that test up to be looking for a shielded cable. It's then going to be looking at signal to noise ratio, uh, the delay, and finally running a bit error rate test. Okay, as you can see here, we have a passing one gig cable. I can see the length of the entire cable as well as the length of each pair. I can see that there is a shield. I can see that I've got acceptable signal to noise ratio, acceptable delay skew, uh, and acceptable BERT test, zero errors. This is a one gig cable. I can feel confident in it. Okay, let's test another cable. So here we have uh, another cable. Let's just go ahead and connect and test and see what we get for results. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click the test button. It's, it's automatically gonna go down to cable three there. Okay, so we got a couple errors here on this cable. Number one, I can see that the shield is not connected. This test was looking for a shield. Shield was not connected and it's failed on that. It would fail on that reason alone. But also I've got a number of miswires in here. So you can see that conductor one is not going across to the other side as the way it, sh or the way it should. Uh, it's going down to eight. It looks like everything is crossed on this. This cable is uh, not is is not wired correctly and would be a problem. The tester picks that up easily. Okay, let's run another test on another cable here. Connect to the XG. Let's see how this cable performs. Connect it over here. Let's go ahead and just hit the test button. First thing it's going to do is check for the wire map of the cable. Um, it's then going to move on to running the additional tests and right out the gate it uh, tells us that there is not a correctly uh, terminated shield on this cable so it's failing our test because we set this up to test for shield. Now you can set up the XG to ignore the shield or, or to test cables that uh, do not have shield but in this instance we do want to have a shield and this cable does not have a properly connected shield, so it fails. You can see the information there. I do get the length of each pair and the overall length of the cable. But again, no shield uh, on this cable and because of that, it has failed. We'll test another cable next. Let's go ahead and connect this cable the same way. And we'll just hit test. It's going to move down to the next label. Okay, we have a passing one gig cable here. Um, it is shielded. Uh, and all four pairs are wired correctly. I can see the length of each pair 
and I can see the overall length of the cable as, where, as well as the signal to noise ratio of each pair. And uh, the, bit error, error, the bit error rate test has zero errors. The XG can also test cables that have M12 connectivity. That's this connector here either X-coded or decoded M12 will work with the XG. We can test for either of those. We can also test cables that are hybrid. In other words, cables that are M12 connector on one side and traditional RJ45 on the other. So, uh, so that shows you a few examples of uh, how the XG can quickly test the cable and qualify it. Um, one of the biggest issues or challenges is also identifying where problems are in a cable if it fails. And that's what this next uh, demo will show you. All right, let's test a cable with multiple segments. Uh, we have uh, a couple patch cables connected to another cable segment here, uh, another patch cable to the end and the remote at the end here. Let's do a, a test on this cable. This is non-shielded cable. Let's see how our results look. Right away, uh, the test fails. Um, it's pretty obvious it's failing the wire map. So what it's telling us here is that the cable is not wired correctly. There's a problem. Where is that problem? Well, it's telling us that in this cable assembly, we have pairs one, two, three, six, and four, five wired correctly. Remember, this is an unshielded cable. So we're not looking for a shield here, but we definitely have a problem with pair seven, eight. Where do we have a problem with seven, eight? The overall length of the cable is uh, around 40 feet. We can see that, but pair seven, eight is only coming in at five, three. That's or five feet. That's telling us that there is an open very, uh, or in this first segment of the cable. So we'll just take a look at that. And sure enough, you can see here, we have an open on that seven, eight pair. <clears throat> So the, uh, the significance of that test uh, is uh, often the problems with the cable is one end or the other, right? You know, where it's terminated, the connector. And oftentimes the way to get up and running quickly is to re-terminate the cable, right? If, if there was damage done there. But if the damage is somewhere in the middle of the cable, it doesn't matter how many times the connectors are re-terminated. So that's why it's very good to have a tool like uh, the XG, which has that TDR, time domain reflectometer technology, which is a way to pinpoint where the wiring issues are uh, to save lots of time. Okay. All right. Um, I also want to point out that uh, we get a lot of questions or, you know, there's a lot of challenges with interference uh, with industrial networks. And uh, way back in February, uh, which seems like that was five years ago to me, although it was just five months, <laughs> um, we, uh, I had a, uh, a trip down to Florida uh, to uh, one of our distributor partners down there. And we visited a water district and, and that water district had uh, uh, an issue with a panel, uh, with, you know, a, a connection from a fiber optic switch to a drive uh, that was timing out and it had been timing out uh, intermittently for over a year. And all the uh, diagnostics showed that the network was fine, the cable was fine, the type of cable tester they used said, yeah, the wiring's good, the shield's there. Uh, and we, I actually disconnected both of the connectors, you know, from the switch and from the PowerFlex drive, hooked up RXG, ran the test that you just showed, you know, that Tom just showed you. And lo and behold, we had bid error rate failures. So the, um, so that means there was actually, uh, you know, bid errors at one gigabit per second 
on what was a 20 foot cable, right? Um, and it ended, ended up being because of the interference induced in that cable by the drive. So though it was a shielded cable, it wasn't shielded enough. They had to upgrade the, you know, the, the grading of the shield uh, and replace that cable. And since then they haven't had any errors. So it just shows you the value of having a tool uh, that can actually detect errors over the cable um, independent of uh, everything else. We also have built into the XG ways to do continuous testing. So if there's intermittent issues, the XG could be set up to run overnight a bit error rate test, which is a good way to detect if there you know, could be intermittent issues with uh, interference based on different things get, that get powered on in the plant. Um, and then also vibration can often damage connectors, especially on moving equipment. And, uh, and that may create a, a um, intermittent problem where sometimes the connection's good, sometimes it's bad. So we can also do a continuous wire map test uh, with that cable. And you can actually flex the connect the, the wires just to see, uh, kind of simulate, uh, you know, the, the movement of the cable, uh, just to uh, see if that cable has a problem or not. So it could be repaired or replaced. All right, so let me quickly walk through <laughs> some of the active tests, uh, the, you know, the layer link two tests, uh, which uh, XG also supports. Uh, we've done kind of a deep dive on the copper troubleshooting capabilities of it. Um, and uh, one of the most useful tests that we have is a network discovery function. And I'm gonna run the video of it uh, because Tom uh, gives you a good demonstration of it and how it's especially useful for detecting duplicate addresses uh, and also discovering what the customer actually has connected to their network. They don't always know, right? So let's just show some active network testing features here. Let me grab a network connected cable. So this cable here, I'm going to connect into the XG. This is connected to a network here in my office. Let's just go down to network tests. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, a link. Okay, so I previously set up IP settings on the XG for DHCP, which is how our network is configured. And I've established a link here, as you can see. So I'm going to work down here on my menu. I notice there's a few choices here, DHCP, discovery, ping, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to choose discovery. And here you can see a list of different device types. And we haven't started the test yet, but you can see there's a few options on the bottom. Uh, we can add devices to ping list. We can look in the uh, list view. We can create reports off of this test. Uh, let's just go ahead and start the test and see how it starts to populate. So right away, you can see that the devices are starting to populate. I'm already up to 51 hosts identified here, four servers identified, a switch identified, I can click on the individual device, like let's click on this switch, the one switch option here, and it's going to pull up that switch. And I notice the switch that we have, we've pulled a Mac, but there's no IP address for that switch, okay? And that's okay. That's uh, more than likely a dumb switch, right? Uh, there's a second switch that's populated since we started talking about this device type, and that switch does have an IP address, so that'd be like a layer three switch. Okay, let's go back out to the map view. Let's look at our servers. We can see our servers listed here. Let's go back out to the map view and let's take a look at the hosts. Significant number of hosts, 115 hosts. And we've got one of those hosts listed in red. We're gonna get to that in a second. But let's just go back out to the map view one more time since you get an idea of looking at the individual device types. And let's look at all of the devices compiled together in the same list. So I'm just going to click on list view here. And now if you notice, we've got hosts, servers, switches, printers, all of those different device types are combined into this, into this uh, large list view. Uh, and it's still populating. The test is running right now as we speak, and more devices are being identified and populated into the list. Now, as I scroll down this list, you notice it's really responsive. Uh, if I click on an individual item in the list, it highlights it in blue, okay? 
And as I go down this list, you'll notice that some of the items are highlighted in red. What does that mean? Well, that means that we've got a duplicate IP on a device, uh, a duplicate IP to another device. So the particular uh, device that we have has a unique Mac, but a duplicate IP address. Uh, this particular IP address is 10.0.5.20. So there's a second device on in our network that is configured with the same IP address. And that's a problem, right? It quickly identifies that. I can sort this entire list by IP address by clicking on this column here at the top. And it's gonna sort those and you can see that there's multiple duplicates there. Uh, this tool does a fantastic job of finding those devices. You can see there, there's our 10, 0520, two different MAC addresses with uh, the same IP address. And the, uh, the great thing about that test too is you can easily save that, uh, the results as a CSV file and import that into Excel uh, as a way to document it and uh, get the information sent around. It's also detecting the unmanaged switches uh, via the MAC address uh, so you know, uh, you know what they are. Um, so a very useful tool. And again, I, I don't have time to tell all my stories, but I did have one manufacturer I did a demo of XG with, and sure enough, we found duplicate addresses on their control network just by plugging it in uh, and running this test. So that was highly valuable when uh, they, they got an XG. Um, the, the next uh, very useful test is pinging, and of course, laptops can ping, you know, for sure. Uh, the XG has a built in way to ping a, a set number of addresses, you know, a large number of addresses. You can easily add them from the uh, function of the, uh, you know, the network scan test we just showed, and also manually enter IP addresses. And the nice thing about the test is it'll run continuously, so you can see how the latency varies. Uh, uh, and report minimum ping time, maximum, and an average. So this is a good way to detect that there's latency issues or reachability issues uh, without having to um, uh, you know, have a laptop connected and do it the traditional way uh, and reporting all this in a CSV as well. Um, similarly, uh, from the XG, you can run a trace route and see the latency between hops if the routing uh, is set up correctly. Uh, and again, that could be very useful uh, instead of having to do it uh, you know, on the laptop and lug that around and also save that as a report. Um, power over Ethernet, I mentioned that uh, is a big trend. Uh, with the XG, we have a quick, easy way to measure PoE to detect if the switch which has PoE to report which version of PoE it has. Uh, in other words, it's wattage rating and then actually load it down, right? To put a load and, and measure the actual vo voltage. Um, the, uh, the voltage, uh, you know, the typical voltage is 48 volts DC for PoE uh, and under load, if uh, that drops significantly, well, you know, you have a, an issue with that switch or that switch is way over budget. It. Um, and again, the XG has a quick way to determine that. Um, I wanted to talk briefly too about uh, the ways XG can troubleshoot uh, fiber links. And again, this gets back to the practical issue of what can go wrong with fiber optic cables, right? And a lot of times it's something as basic as a dirty connector, a damaged connector, um, an issue with the SFP uh, interface, which is shown here on the left. So using two of our XGs, we have natively built in uh, SFP ports. You can do an end-to-end -end test, uh, which will report uh, the, you know, the optical length of the cable, uh, the, um, the optical drop of, of it, uh, do a speed test okay, or op optical loss, do a speed test to qualify, can that 
is this fiber link supporting the speed I need it to? Uh, and then also uh, test the SFP itself, right? So, and all of this is done without having to do any set reference to, you know, to be a fiber optic physics expert. Uh, you know, it's, it's not an OTDR, you know, I don't want to position it as something that can pinpoint where there's fiber optic uh, cable breaks. Uh, you know, we don't do optical TDR with this. We have other tools for that that's, you know, three times the price, <laughs> right? But uh, uh, it's, it is very practical and useful. Um, there's also a mode where you could connect in our fiber optic microscope uh, as a way to inspect the in-face, the fiber optic connector, uh, grade it, uh, see how dirty or damaged it is. And again, 80, 90% of the time there's a problem with fiber optics, it's often uh, because of the connector. So that's uh, built in and, and you can save this as a, a nice uh, PDF report as well. So, uh, so anyway, that's a quick overview of uh, troubleshooting industrial networks. I did very little, uh, you know, I didn't do a deep dive at all on the fiber optics, I, I know, um, but we hope it's useful for you as a way to see how having the right tool or having, making sure your customer has the right tool uh, can really help in quick troubleshooting to get, uh, you know, a production line back up and running during startup uh, to ensure that uh, you're not spending a lot of time, uh, you know, talking to IT or the contractor, but can do your job, right? Uh, and XG helps, uh, you know, reduce the troubleshooting time uh, of all that, you know, having that qualifier type tool, right? Um, softing, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, our theme is get connected, stay connected. Uh, the XG is obviously a great tool for staying connected. Uh, we also have an our portfolio uh, certifier class product for Ethernet, uh, fiber optic OTDR. Uh, we also have a Profibus tester, and it's amazing to me how many millions of nodes <laughs> of Profibus are still in use. And that network in its in of itself has some uh, interesting challenges, and, and we have a very useful, easy to use portable tool uh, to troubleshoot that. Um, the other side of the portfolio is uh, focused very much on uh, getting connected, uh, ways to move data from Rockwell PLCs into SQL databases or up to cloud uh, services to support uh, apps, um, do field bus connectivity. Uh, we're experts with open PCUA connectivity as well. And most recently, we acquired a company called Phoenix Digital that does uh, high reliability dual fiber optic uh, ethernet switches, both standalone switches, industrial grade, as well as uh, rack mount, um, PLC mount for control logics, compact logics. So very, so that's a quick key overview of uh, what Softing does. Uh, our North American headquarters, uh, which includes includes our support staff and, and sales and engineering here on this side of the, the pond, as they say, is in Knoxville, Tennessee, and then Munich, Germany is our uh, global headquarters. So this time uh, we have a few minutes left for questions. I think I saw a couple of them on the Q&A box. Um, and it looks like they've been answered. Uh, we, I'll just uh, mention that we do get, um, a uh, uh, we I did we did get a question about the 2.5 gig and the 5 gig. Um, those are uh, bit bit error rate test speeds that you can set on the XG. We did we have different levels of the XG depending on the speed of the test. It's the same physical hardware, uh, just different licenses to unlock the higher speeds. So yes, you can set it up to test a cable at 2.5 gig and 5 gig uh, if you have the licenses installed for those speeds all the way up potentially to 10 gig. Uh, so uh, someone had asked that earlier and um, very good. So if there's not any other questions, I'll turn the, uh, the session back over to Colin. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Jim. On behalf of CSIA, I would just like to thank all of those attending and also thank Jim and softing for this informative discussion. We hope you found this webinar informational. I uh, just wanted to let you know that we do have on the Control Sys page recordings of previous webinars and our on online events calendar is pretty much built out to the end of the year. So 
if you can go over there and just check on some webinars you may like, uh, we would appreciate it. Other than that, I uh, thank you all for joining and have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Colin.